Are you ready for this? I have never been as excited to make a YouTube video because today we are in Shetland. We are going to see something that's uniquely Scottish, but we're going to see the absolute best example of it. And we're getting to take you there when there's nobody else there. We're going to Musa Broch. So if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me take you to some place you'd be crazy to miss. Say Scotland and people think bagpipes and kilts and haggis and tartan. Now, I love all of them, but all these market and men's wet dreams are things that you'll find in other countries in one form or another. What we're going to visit today is something you only get in Scotland. And yet I wonder how many of you have ever been to one. Well, today I'm going to show you the best broch you can ever see. Musa broch. Now, Musa Broch is in Shetland and I feel like the luckiest man alive because Promote Shetland have sponsored me to come to talk about Shetland. Say Shetland and you don't think about bagpipes, kilts or tartan, you think about up hell they are, fishing, oil, fiddle music and brochs are even more Shetlandy than they are Scottish. So what's a broch, I hear you ask? A broch is an Iron Age construction that's unique to Scotland. In fact, they're almost exclusively found in the north of Scotland and its islands. Here's a map showing where you'll find known broch remains. They reckon that there are between five to six hundred of them across Scotland that have survived since the Iron Age in various states of repair, but a quarter of them are in Shetland. So if you want to see brochs in their natural habitat, this is a place to be. From 5 to 15 metres in height, in case you're younger than 50, 20 to 50 feet internal diameter, in case you're older than 50, if you're European or American you can fight it out amongst yourselves. They're big, round and mainly collapsed ancient buildings but not the one that we're going to see. A broch is a bit like a tower of two concentric cylinders, an outer wall and an inner wall. And in between the two walls, a spiral staircase takes you from one level to another. There might be compartments inside the tower on the ground floor, wooden flooring across to create upper floors and probably a roof on top. It's difficult to be exactly definitive about brochs because they come in very different types. Some have smaller round houses on the outside, some are next to rich farmland, others are solitary and on rocky outcrops. Their name synonymous with fort, but keep your pants on, I'll come to function in a minute. Most of them were built around a hundred years before or after the birth of Christ. Now, I'm not suggesting that he had anything to do with them, right? Like three wise men saw a star in the east and much further north and east again, they heard tell of cylindrical forts that were uniquely Scottish and the shepherd said, lo, I heard you get some bonny good looking sheep up there and they're proper good at kissing. No, I think that the whole Jesus thing was coincidence. And there were some outliers that had been built a bit before that as well. I'm just saying that most of them appeared in the north of what we now call Scotland on exactly the day that Jesus was born, assuming around an era of about 100 years or more. But why did they appear? The obvious answer would seem to be for defence. Big strong towers appearing at a time when iron weapons started to become available. 50% of brochs are surrounded by some kind of defensive formation or barrier. People had been consolidating for some time, living closer together. The next step was to live communally for protection. The locations where there were houses round about the broch surely meant that people retreated from these houses into the broch in times of danger, 
just like a Norman castle a thousand years later. The problem is that apparently archaeologists have never found any evidence of conflict, battle or aggression around Brox. Although I've got a wee snippet from a Viking saga for you later. Another explanation was that this was just a big posh house for the Iron Age Lord of the Manor, a des res for the local toff, where his underlings literally lived under him. Or maybe round about him. The Broch was a status symbol rather than protection. So why is it that some of them are found in remote barren areas, postcodes where everybody's shooting but nobody's hunting or fishing? That'll be America then. There may be trouble ahead. I'm seeing postcodes where self-respect and estate agents have to resort to the descriptive up and coming. Where you look at the particulars and you say, Agnes, a five bedroom house with an integral double garage and a swimming pool and a tennis court and we can afford it. And the sales agent says, I, it's in Fife. It's okay, the Fifers can take a joke. And very few of them have got guns. The point is that people who know way more than me are still arguing over the motivation. So if you thought a deeply insightful answer was more likely than a puerile joke, then you've only got yourself to blame. But I will make one observation though. As we head across the sound to the stunningly preserved Broch and Musa, the island of Moss, on the mainland opposite are the remains of Burlan Broch. Like two centuries guarding the sound they stand. If there is a pattern, then that type of watchful sentinel seems to repeat on land and sea. Are they forts set up by a military society to scan and protect the land and seas? But now it's time to meet the star of the show. And not just this show. Musa Broch also starred in Ian Rankin's 1997 Rebus crime thriller, Black and Blue. Now, I won't spoil the plot. Are you Rebus readers? I love Rebus books. They feel, they feel about as authentically Scottish as any other books that I can think of. Let me know in the comment section if you read Rebus. And if not, why not? Musa Broch also starred in a Viking saga. In fact, two. Both sagas involved eloping couples, but 200 years apart, who stopped off at Musa Broch. It was the Gretna Green of Norse medieval romance. The Orkney Inga saga tells us that in 1153, a certain young Elrond eloped with Margaret, the mother of Earl Harold Maddison. What is more? Have you no shame, sir? Truth be told, it was all mixed up in the complex power politics between the Canmore kings of Scotland and the Norse kings as to who would control Caithness, Sutherland and these Northern Isles. It was all during the reign of David I of Scotland. Anyway, Elrond and the cougar mum, rawr, came from Orkney to Shetland to elope and settled down with Elrond's band of followers. Errol Harold, let's call him Cougarson, and I'd love it if that was actually a real name, came up and laid siege to the broch, shouting, that's my maw, Yarandi Raj. But apparently, he found it too secure to storm. So there was a reconciliation, everybody put down their weapons, Elrin married Margaret, and they just had a series of awkward Christmas dinners. Followed by a murder. It's the kind of thing that happened up here. You can see how it might have been difficult to storm. They reckon it stood since 300 BC. One of the outliers that we mentioned earlier. 
but an outlier in more ways than one. It's the tallest surviving and was probably the tallest ever broch at 43 feet 6 inches tall. It has the smallest diameter of any broch, but at 15 feet its walls are much thicker than in others. Is that what's preserved this broch? Is this why it stood the test of time? Thousands of stones about a foot by six inches placed carefully and held together, not with cement, but gravity and balance. There would have been a surrounding wall about 20 feet out from the broch that was more than seven feet thick. They tell me that the wall came first and the broch came later. So if not for defence, then why this arrangement? To be honest, it's not the why of this broch that lures me here, it's the fact of it. To walk through a door that was walked through by our Iron Age forefathers. To look into the guard cell and the watchman who kept the door. To walk into the tower and inhabit the space where prehistory comes to life. It's magical. People cooked here. People talked here. People laughed, exchanged views. They planned for the fallen years, setting out goals and dreams for the future. Did they scheme? Did they plot? Were they happy with their lot? Glad to be within these protective or respected walls. Later, they built huts and wheelhouses inside here. But as I sit on a bench on which people sat centuries ago, I wonder, did they wonder what the future would hold? As they sat on this bench, could they have imagined a boat that crossed from Shetland mainland to Musa without oar or sail, but driven by diesel oil drilled from the very rock beneath the sea out there? Could they have conceived machines that fly, bringing visitors from the huge island to the south? Did they build this place as protection from visitors from the south? As they burned what scarce fuel surroundings provided, could they have imagined a world where there would be so much burning that it would change the very sea level around them? How did you see life, my Iron Age Shetlander? I visited lots of historical sites in my journeys to understand the people, places and events in Scottish history. All have been intriguing. Some have been magical. But few have been quite as magical as this. Did they climb these stairs to bed, or to work, to play? Did they feel proud, special, safe? There are so many questions that I'd like to ask the spirits of the men and women who walked these galleries, passing on the stairs, apologising for getting in the way, asking to borrow a needle so carefully carved from bone, showing a cousin a new tool made from the so recently discovered iron. Who would have been in there? How would they have lived? When they climbed to the top of their broch, did they feel as privileged as I do now? They could hardly have imagined the journey to our time. But we can come to Shetland and visit theirs. We can stand in the same place they did. For years I've wanted to come here and see this for myself. I'm not disappointed. This is truly astonishing. You'd be crazy not to want to come here and experience it for yourself. If you want to know about another must-see place from our history, then there's one coming up on screen now. In the meantime, Hamian Doch is going to be a lamb alive. Cheery and drastic.